Hey knitters, welcome to episode 174 of the Knitty McPurly podcast. I'm your host, Devin Ventry. You can find me at knittymcpurly.com. I'm Knitty McPurly on Instagram. And if you want to email me, I am Devin at knittymcpurly.com. Welcome to the podcast. It is an absolutely gorgeous April day out today. I went to school with a girl named April Day. I haven't thought of her in a long time, but today I did. <laughs> Welcome to the Knitting Podcast. Um, is this better? Last time, a lot of you told me I was too far away from the camera and the microphone, so hopefully this is better. Hopefully you can hear me and you get the captions and all that. Um, do you remember last time when I talked about my sweater my wildflower sweater and how it reminded me of this art type that I had magnets of when I was a kid. And so I'm Googling 80s roosters and the internet was like, we do not know. Well, my mom remembered because at that time we lived outside of Philadelphia, not far from, you know, Pennsylvania Dutch country. And so my mom had, we had gone to this like outdoor Pennsylvania Dutch market and that's where we got those magnets. And those are called hex signs. And that's exactly it. Like she, my mom didn't remember. And then she went back. She's like, that's what it is. They're hex signs. So <clears throat> barn signs or hex signs came into existence in the 1940s as a way to make the barn store a more portable art form. The designs ranging in, in, in size from eight inches to four feet are usually painted on a wooden disc. So this is an American thing. It's a Pennsylvania Dutch thing. And it's not that old. The earliest barn star from this area of Pennsylvania is from 1819. Um, and then they became more prevalent after the Civil War. But around the 1940s through the 60s, you found them more prevalently. Uh, Milton Hill of Virginville, PA, was one of the early barn star painters beginning in the 1940s through the 1960s. He is noted as the first commercial hex sign painter at the Kutztown, PA German Festival. He coined the phrase that hex signs are just for nice, meaning that they're just for decorative purposes. So these birds that are on them are sometimes called distal finks. They're not chickens at all. They're just birds. And all of the things have a meaning. Sometimes they're stars, sometimes they're birds, tulips, roses, all of these things have a meaning unless you're Milton Hill who says they're just for nice. So anyway, I love them. I absolutely love this style of art. Thank you to my Floridian friend, Sherry, who sent me this Florida cup. I've got some kombucha in there right now. I saved it from grocery day. My kids are like, where's my kombucha? I'm like, mm, saved it. Okay, progress and shop news. Anyway, that was a little fun history lesson. After last week, a lot of you were like, tell us about the knit along. And I was like, let's, let's do a knit along. So I talked about the summer vibe top last week and the week before, and I've started knitting mine. And I'm going to talk more about that this episode, but we're also going to do a knit along. So if you want to join in, you could absolutely stash bust this project because, or use minis. If you have 20 gram fingering weight minis, depending on what size you need to make, uh, you could definitely use minis. You're basically knitting the front and the back and sewing them together. That's what this project is. It's very simple. So I thought for the knit along, let's do the month of May. Can we do that? Is that not enough time? Is, is a month not enough time? Tentatively, we'll start May 1st and go through the 30th, but if people need more time, we can extend it a little bit. Maybe six weeks would be better since it's a fingering weight top, but there's no sleeves. It's pretty simple, garter stitch. So we're gonna use the hashtag KMP Summer Vibe Cal. KMP Summer Vibe K-A-L. I need to get in touch with this designer too, just to let her know that we're doing a knit along for her sweater and that we love it. 
If you're interested in a Knitty McPurley kit to make this, um, the yarn is drastically reduced because you're gonna be buying nine skeins of it. And that's a crazy amount of yarn. So I feel like it was about $90 off what you would pay you know, per skein if you were going to buy these skeins individually. Oh, sorry, allergies, allergy season. Um, it's funny, when I first went to put together this podcast with the progress in shop news, I was like, I have none because this week killed me. Tons of you wanted the kits. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you love them as much as I do and you want them. And there's more on the website as pre-orders. Some of those have already been dyed. I have been dyeing yarn like a crazy fiend all week. And it was the first week back after a week off of homeschooling. And so that crushed us. It was, it was really, it was kind of a hard week. This week was kind of terrible, if we're being honest. I'm really glad that it's over and I get to start another week. I have six more weeks of homeschooling my son and I am very, very happy to next year be sending him off to the school where my older kids go. Very, very happy. Like the next four months are a ton of transition in my life. Not bad, all good, but my oldest daughter's going to college. My son, I only have one boy, is gonna be going to school. And so next year, it's just gonna be me and Charlotte. And uh, that's going to be a big, big change. It's going to be great in a lot of ways, I think. Um, if you ordered something from me and it hasn't, you haven't like seen movement on it, it will go out on Monday. Like I said, it was a crazy week. Everything is on the way. It's just some of it a little slow. I know some of you, lots of you already got your kits, but for those of you who haven't gotten it yet, those will go out very, very soon. So... I posted on Instagram about my summer vibe top. I followed all the directions, okay? I did the swatch just like I was supposed to. It's beautiful. Look how pretty it is. <laughs> it's just so great. So I did everything I was supposed to do. I got gauge. And then when I got about this far on it, it was just too long. And I held it up to myself and I was like, this is just too big and this is not even blocked. As it stood, even before blocking, it was gonna be about 42 inches around. And I do not want a shirt that's too big. I won't wear it. If it doesn't look cute, I'm not gonna wear it. Speaking of looking cute, how about my Benedicta sweater? This is the perfect sweater for today because it was cold this morning and it's starting to warm up right now. It is, um, let's see, it's about 9.30 in the morning and it's going to be warm later, but it's not warm yet. So I've got my Benedicta on. I feel like I wear this on the podcast a lot. I need to make another one so that I can mix it up a little bit, but this is a great sweater. Covers down to the elbows. You can knit it as long as you want. My favorite sweater length is right at the hip bone. Uh, I just think that looks really nice. And I've also got my stitch marker necklace on. My grace and wood earrings. Anyway, um, yeah, so I got this far and I was like, I will not wear this. Like, I'm not going to wear this. So I didn't rip it out. I didn't even bind it off. All I did was thread it, uh, thread a piece of yarn through there. I even left the stitch markers on there. Like, <laughs> like a belly dancer, woo woo. <laughs> but it's pretty, it's just too big. So, piece of advice. I, I don't even know, I don't even know if this is advice that I can give because people knit differently. You know, I did what I was supposed to do and I got gauge, but it didn't work out. So what I decided to do is to go down a size. I was originally gonna make the third size, because that was supposed to be about a 38 inch circumference, which gives me about two inches of positive ease because my body measurement at the bust is 36. So I just want about two inches of positive ease. Not all, I don't want it to be tight, but I don't want it to be baggy either. So I went down a garment size and let me see what she says it's supposed to be. She says that should be 90 centimeters is about 
which she says it should be approximately 34 inches. I did that math in my head, so I don't know how accurate it is, but that's just not what happened to me. Also, she used a US 2.5, which is a three millimeter needle, and I went down to a US 1. So I was originally doing this one on a smaller needle already than what was called for. I was using a um, 2.75 millimeter needle and I went down to a US 1, which I believe is a 2.5. Now it is a little bit squished onto this, this 16 inch needle, but when it is stretched out, this is about 19 inches across, a little bit less, maybe about 18.5 uh, to 19 inches across, which gives me a 37 to 38 inch circumference, which is exactly what I want. So even though I got gauge, I went down a needle size and a garment size, and that gave me what I want. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about this <clears throat> in the topic of the week, but for now, that's my helpful information. If you are kind of a looser knitter like I am, and you don't want your top to be too big, because remember, this is kind of a lacy pattern too. And so it when you block it, it's going to stretch. It's gonna, The lace is going to open up a little bit. So don't err on the side of too big because you can always block it a little bit more aggressively if you need to. I would rather do that than have something that I'm like swimming in that I'm not gonna wear because it's not cute. If it's not cute, I'm not gonna wear it. So that is what I did and that totally worked for me. Okay, so another thing that I did, which will segue us right into our topic of the week. Oh, one more thing before I get there. I didn't really notice this at first. I'll just, I'm just gonna put the picture up on the screen. If you look at this, she has the wrong side out. See how you see those stitches uh, on the garter? I mean, th this is what would traditionally be called the wrong side, but it looks great. So you could really make this reversible or you could pick the way you want it to, you want to wear it and you can wear it either right side out or wrong side out. So this is what would traditionally be considered the right side where you don't see those stitches coming through. And then that one would be considered the wrong side, but this is the side that she has out. So I guess it's just whatever you like more. This is a little bit tidier and maybe a little bit more, you know, perfecter, but this is kind of awesome too. I like them both. Okay. So on, in the pattern, and we talked about this last week with the double decreases, the designer uses knit three together and you can see how that looks. So we've got one, two, three, knit three together. It looks just fine. I think it looks great. But since I had to start over, I was originally just going to do it her way. But after we talked about the double decreases last time, I thought, I think I'm going to try a centered double decrease. Now, if you're working on stockinette fabric, your centered double decrease is going to look like this. Very, very tidy, looks super centered. And when you're working on garter stitch, it's just not quite that way. So this is not an exact comparison because it is not blocked, but I think this does look a little bit more centered than the knit three together. So I just thought I would show you that. I made a little video with a little bit more close-ups on that and showing them side by side and how to work that super simple double decrease. And I thought that even though it's a little harder to learn it because you have to learn it and remember what to do and in what order. It's a little harder for your brain, but a little easier for your hands to work this center double decrease as compared to a knit three together. Knit three together mentally is super simple, but I think for your hands, it can get a little bit fiddly. Anyway, here is that video. Okay, so you can see that this is my blocked swatch. And here I have the knit three together. So there's three lines of them. And you can see they look absolutely fine, just totally fine. But if you wanted to do a centered double decrease, here is the example of the one that I started that I pulled. I didn't pull it out. All I did was thread 
uh, a thread through there. I even left the stitch markers in. And you can see how it looks unblocked. So it's pretty much the same, just a little bit <clears throat> bumpier. Now, in this version, I decided to go with a centered double decrease, and that's what that looks like. So here is my center double decrease right next to the knit three together. It's, it's hard to compare. That one is blocked. Let's compare the two that are both unblocked. So they both have a little bit of a lumpiness to them, but this is the knit three together and this one is the centered decrease. I think I think I like it better. It's a little t bit tidier. It will lay flat once it's blocked. But overall, I think that either one is are just fine. So I just wanted to show you how to work that. Now, <clears throat> now the reason this looks like this is because this is garter stitch. A lot of times you see this in an example that's stockinette. So, okay. So this is a very simple process to do this center double decrease. All you do is you can see that <clears throat> this is our decrease here. So that's the center stitch and these two stitches on the outer side of it. These three are going to create our double decrease. So I'm gonna slip two stitches together knitwise like that and that changes the mount of them that changes their orientation by slipping them knitwise. And then I knit one, and then all I'm gonna do is take those two that I slipped and pass them over. It is so easy, so, so simple. Uh, I decided to go with that for this one. I don't know, I just thought I would try it out and I really like it. But I think the knit three together is also just fine. Okay. The comment section this week is huge because I had so many comments. I had amazing comments on YouTube, but also many people emailed me with great, great comments. There's a lot of pattern recommendations. So our knitting fantasies are going to be scattered throughout the comment section because there are just tons of them. So last week we talked about how Maggie is having a boy and we were disappointed that we weren't going to be able to knit the cute dresses. Well, podcast watcher named Kathy said, hold the phone. There are tons of amazing boy patterns out there. And she sent me beautiful, adorable pictures of her grandson modeling them for us. So here is her grandson in Petite Knits Willem's overalls. Oh my gosh. These are adorable. Uh, here he is in the hipster cardigan. And she also made a little hat to coordinate with the cardigan. Oh my gosh. Adorable. Here is another tiny baby hat knit in that kind of orange and greenish black variegated yarn that just looks so good and just so boy. You really can't go wrong with orange for a boy. I love that. And then this, this one was Gigi's favorite. This is Debbie, the Debbie Bliss baseball jacket. It is so cute. Oh my gosh, it's adorable. So I do, I stand corrected because these are amazing. This is just the first time that I'm going to eat crow today. <laughs> and I'm going to express another opinion that you guys aren't going to like. So I may have to eat crow on that later too. We'll see. So it, these patterns made me remember when my sister-in-law had a boy and I knit her the baby sophisticate sweater. This is a really great boy pattern. Uh, it's free, it's worsted weight. It's a super simple cardigan with a shawl collar. I forgot all about that pattern. So that one is really, really good. If I can find a picture of my nephew wearing it when he was a baby, he's about to, he just turned 11. He's the same age as my son, so uh, it's been a long time since I knit that, but it, it's a really good pattern. Also, on Instagram, I found these adorable pants. Look how cute they are. They're called the first impression pants because the baby is new to the world. So cute. This is a free pattern. It's from Drops Design. Here's an adorable baby modeling it for us. Oh my gosh. 
fingering weight, it comes in four sizes. It's like newborn, three months, six months, 12 to 18 months, I think. But this person who posted it on Instagram, Knitting Tradition, said, these pants fit forever because they're ribbed and you know you can put them on any size. And they made me think also of those uh, Willem's overalls that Kathy made, like, <laughs> so cute, just adorable, where they'll fit forever, you know? Especially if you made like different levels of buttons. I don't know, a lot of babies sleep on their bellies. You know how there's this like, every few years it switches, put your baby on their backs or they'll die, or put your baby on their stomachs or they'll die, whatever, whatever the trend is of the moment. My son would only sleep on his stomach. If I tried to put him on his back, he'd just lay there and scream. So, you know, the buttons for a stomach sleeper could be annoying, but if it's back sleeping season, then <laughs> that would be just fine. Anyway, I stand corrected. There are tons of amazing boy patterns out there. Okay, here is me eating crow again, because I have very staunchly affirmed that color dominance is fake, that it's a conspiracy theory. If you're talking about color dominance, just put on your tinfoil hat and we'll all sit back and be like, mm, woo. <laughs> okay, so a lovely podcast watcher named Susan sent me this picture. Okay, two socks, right? Take a look at the heel flap. One looks blue, green in the background, and one looks green with blue in the background. And she says, Devin, I thought you might find this interesting. I recently knit these color work socks. Blue is not a favorite color of mine, and she is either Canadian or British because she spelled favorite and color with U's. And she says, as I was knitting the heel, I thought, oh darn, I had the blue on the bottom instead of the green. I just went with it on the first sock, but I knew I would reverse it on the second one with the heel turns in the color that was dominant. There is no getting away from it on this project that color dominance matters. It is a major difference. So the skeptic in me, my first response mentally was to say, now wait a minute. When I knit a heel, I'm knitting a slip stitch heel. So if this is a slip stitch, maybe that's what we're talking about. So I, I messaged her back and I said, now, is this a one by one rib, no slipping stitches? And she was like, this is one by one rib, no slipping, no purling, this is legit. So I have to admit that Susan has changed my mind at least some of the time. And the reason that I say some of the time is because take a look at this one by one rib. Sorry, it's in this area here. Well, look here. <laughs> I paid no attention to what color was where. Shouldn't that like, does it just all balance out? Because I probably flipped it around. I feel like some of the time it matters. This is also more stretched whereas the heels are a little bit, I don't know if they're blocked or not, but still it's tighter because it's the heel. So I would love to see another example of this. Sorry for not being totally on board and saying that color dominance, it obviously exists because it was a factor in these socks. But I, I think I would have to still say that it doesn't always matter. Too skeptical? <laughs> Okay, just wait, just wait. You guys are gonna hate this. <laughs> so many people commented on the wool linen thing. The sheep wool and the linen mixed together is a no-no for hardcore Jews because God said no to it, right? So many of you commented on this. And the, the most prevalent comment was about frequency. Apparently, and you guys sent me articles, you you know sent me quotes explaining to me what this frequency thing is. Fibers vibrate in different ways. And the story is, the word on the street about linen and wool is that because they have opposite frequencies, they cancel each other out. Now, I am not doubting the creator of the universe. If God said in the Old Testament to 
the Jewish nation, don't wear this fiber. That's what God said. Fine. I don't need to know why, but I am kind of curious why. Is it frequency or is it what Christina, a podcast watcher, emailed to me? This, I loved her whole, everything that she wrote because it was so curious and what she found and chose to include in her email was so interesting and informative. She said, thank you again for a wonderful podcast. The mere suggestion of not wearing wool and linen together stunned me as I loved wearing both. So I took some time to scan the internet for details. This site on Jewish practice intrigued me and I think you will find it interesting too. And this is Chabad, C-H-A-B-A-D dot org. And there's an article about the mixture of wool and linen. And this said, and this one resonated with me the most, Mixing wool and linen is akin to mixing and unleashing the spiritual forces associated respectively with Cain and Abel and having and can't have damaging results. Remember, Cain brought the sacrifice of flax from which linen is made and Abel sacrificed sheep producers of wool. Wow, like I never even thought of that. I just thought that was so interesting. That makes sense to me in a spiritual kind of metaphysical way. I get that. And then she said, I also found another, a number of other websites by folks that sell hemp and cotton and linen products that spoke of resonance and vibrations, 5,000 each being canceled out by the two together because they both vibrate at 5,000 megahertz, but in opposite directions slash rotations. And some websites suggested that that was bad for your health. And that, to me, sounds just new agey. I don't know. I don't like it. But that doesn't make it false. <laughs> me not liking it doesn't make it false. So maybe it is the case. I don't know. Both are interesting. Uh, and then Christina says, I won't inform Pearl Soho of the risk as their ever popular linen quill is 50% wool, 35% alpaca, and 15% linen. Oh, the horror. Uh, yeah, a lot of you mentioned that yarn, that it's very popular. And I had one Jewish commenter from last week say, I know, and I might even, I think I even included that comment. She said, um, yeah, I just don't use that yarn. She's like, it's no big deal. I just don't use it. There's lots of other yarns out there, which is just the absolute best way to look at anything that you don't like, right? Or, or that you don't want, or that isn't for you. It's just to say, well, I don't use that. I use something else. So those were just the email comments that I got. Like, so, so good. The, okay, on to the YouTube comments. Judy Crafts says, there is a kind of Scandinavian folk art co called rose mauling or rose mailing. It was popular for home decor a while back. That might be what you're thinking of. Now I Googled it and I came up with these gorgeous, gorgeous pictures. Probably these are related somehow to the distal fink hex signs from the Pennsylvania Dutch. Um, they're gore. I just love this type of art where it's highly stylized, bright colors, white background. I just love it. So this is very similar, Judy, to what I was thinking of. And I bet that they are related too. Uh, Kimberly says, I love Gigi's owl blanket so much. Find Inga at Knitting Traditions. She had the cutest little pants for a baby. Even though she had a little girl, everything was so cute. And then she commented too about my background. So I've been moving stuff around and I'm trying to be closer and just let me know, you know, your opinion. I've, I've tilted my camera to accommodate my crooked shelf. I'd kind of like to take it down and put something else up there, but we'll see. Life is busy. Melissa, whose husband thought that I podcasted from the toilet, <laughs> said, I'm watching the episode late because we were in Middlefield, Ohio, chasing the eclipse. Who got to see the eclipse? Oh my gosh. I learned this time that if you're not directly in the path and you don't really have any effect. I saw nothing where I was, but I know the people in, who, in the path and the people who went to the path 
really got to see an amazing thing. And apparently it's not gonna happen again for a while nearby in the Eastern United States. So it was really awesome if you got to go. Anyway, she says, my husband got a kick out of hearing you tell his bathroom story. He said, because of him, you will never forget me. Also, because I met you, Melissa, and we're buddies now. So <laughs> she says, and the Sanctum balm that I purchased at the winery, he has used it as beard butter a couple of times. There might be a new market for your balm. This balm really is universal. And I know I've talked about this before, but I, I have started using it as like lotion. You will be a little bit tacky. So it's a good thing to do before bed. But, you know, if you have aging skin, as we all do, as you get a little older, just putting some good stuff on there makes it look a little bit better in direct sunlight. <laughs> so I've been putting it on my legs and on my arms and on my neck and just trying to, you know, soak in all the goodness of the balm. Erica said, I love that you're making the kits more affordable for those of us who want to knit the tea. You are truly the spirit of the craft. Devin. Thank you so much. What a great compliment. I appreciate that. And then she says, your owl blanket is fire, Gigi. Great podcast. And someone sent a knitting story. Well, someone did. I have a knitting story today, but I don't have one for next week. You guys, 52 a year is how many I need. Uh, actually, though, uh, there might not be a podcast in two weeks, but there might be. I don't know. Anyway, send me a knitting story. Gigi's currently working on this blanket. She is putting the backing on and attaching the, you know, the border that you often see on baby blankets that like goes like this on the blanket. It's like a satiny border. She's doing that right now. So hopefully we'll get to see that next week. Beachwood says, I have so many comments from this great episode. First of all, it was great to see Gigi again and her blanket for Maggie's baby boy looks great. I think the idea of a mobile is great, and I've been looking for make at making one too. I love these patterns. The Monster Mobile by Rebecca Danger. Everything Rebecca does is amazing. I absolutely love her. She's also a wonderful human being. The Little Prince Mobile by Eva Penafiel. The Sleepy Owl Mobile by Oliesa Pronieva and The Monster Mobile by Yvonne Marcus. Oh my gosh, these are all so cute. Love, love, love. Karen Woolley says, as a crochet designer and instructor, I can tell you the names of the stitches are because of the number of times you pull through two loops. So to complete a single, you yarn over and pull through two loops once, hence single. To complete a double crochet, you yarn over and pull through two loops twice, hence double. So the half double is half a double because you're still yarning over before pulling up a loop in the stitch, just like a double, but you have three loops on your hook, but you're only doing a yarn over and pulling through one time. That makes sense. That's why it's a half double. Okay. So it keeps going. Triple crochet, you pull it through two loops three times as the stitch gets taller. And then she clarifies this only applies to US terms. If you are knitting in the UK, all bets are off. Like they just have totally different directions. I learned this when I was knitting uh, my kit that I got that Julie recommended. What was it called? I can't remember. I'll think of it and link it below. And I had to comment um, to contact my friend Tara. And I was like, Tara, I do not understand. What does this mean? And she's like, this is a British pattern, so here's what you do. It's something totally different. <clears throat> okay, I have a wonderful, amazing knitting story for you today Come that comes from a podcast watcher named Lori. Hi, Lori. Poor Lori has been trying to send this to me for two weeks. Uh, she sent one half of it and it didn't go through, and then she sent the other half and it did go through, but it didn't make sense because it was the second half. Anyway, in the end, I got it. And Lori says, I'm retyping this because it's now outdated. She said, I originally said I was knitting my first sweater, the Audrey sweater for Easter and was almost done. She said, I finished it and wore it on Easter. I am 61, says Lori, and I learned to knit and crochet from my mother and grandmother. And while I have crocheted a little, I love knitting more. Me too. I feel the same way. 
I've knit a lot over the years, mostly scarves, shawls, blankets, hats, baby items, etc. But I've recently finally mastered sock knitting. And like I said above, I just finished my first adult sweater. Yay, that's awesome. I'm about to cast on a Diggory tee next. Fabulous. The only thing tricky about Diggory, Audrey is great because it's top down, super simple. The only thing tricky about Diggory is that it is bottom up. I don't know. I don't know if that makes it trickier or not. Lori says, here are examples of my family's knitting. She says, my grandmother knit this adorable little doll and it is still in great shape. Oh my gosh, it looks so good. My mother knit the chicken with the chick and the egg. Oh my gosh, the one that you and Gigi talked and laughed about a few episodes ago. And I have carried on the tradition and knit my granddaughters the unicorn and the elephant. These are so good. The unicorn and elephant patterns are from Little Cobbit Little Cotton Rabbits on Etsy. I'm going to knit the fox for my new grandson next. My daughter never showed interest in crocheting or knitting, but my granddaughter, my son's daughter, has. She has been asking me to teach her how to knit, but I thought she was too young. And she is five, and I would agree with you, Lori, that five, I think I taught all my girls to learn around four or five, and they are, it's very hard at that age and they very rarely keep up with it. However, Lori has sent us a video of her amazing five-year-old granddaughter knitting. And you're gonna watch this and you're gonna be like, <laughs> but this is what five-year-olds look like when they're knitting and it's working, it's working. Like her stitches are loose, but she's doing them. So here is that. Step one, step two, step three, and step Isn't that crazy? Like she did such a good job. Gold star, Lori's granddaughter. She says she has a lot of energy and I was pretty sure she wouldn't sit still long enough. I finally broke down when she said, Mimi, will you teach me how to knit? I've been practicing. Well, I didn't know what she was doing to practice. And she came up with this idea to start a scarf on her own. Since she lives across town, we have her for a few days at a time, so progress is slow, but she is doing it. I am one proud grandmother. Wow, so good. So you can teach little, little kids how to knit. Most of them will not be as good as this. They will not be able to have the patience to do that, uh, but some of them will. So I've got high hopes for this little girl. I wanna see what she makes next as she gets older. Cause by the time, you know, in five years, she can just be cranking stuff out. You guys follow, you know, Jonah, who's like 17 now, but he's this little, well, he was this little adorable kid who just crocheted so fast. So great. I love watching kids do that. Thank you so much, Lori, for the wonderful story. Thank you for joining me. I am gonna go sit on the porch. It's gonna be almost 80 today. And I'm going to knit my sweater, and that's all I'm going to do today. Praise God. <laughs> Have a wonderful week, and I will see you next week.